I think Camille Labchuk is the future. Still in her early 30s, she's been an environmental and animal rights activist for more than 20 years, beginning when she was nine and saw television images of the seal hunt off her native Prince Edward Island. She went on to become a Green Party activist, and when Elizabeth May became the party's leader, Camille Labchuk became its first staffer. Seeing close up the power and usefulness of Elizabeth May's law degree, Camille resigned to go to law school. She wanted to become an animal rights lawyer, and she did. In 2014, she established the first animal rights law practice in Canada. She's now the executive director of Animal Justice, a not-for-profit legislative fund dedicated to advocating for the humane treatment of animals. As a lawyer, she defends activists and animals in the courts, including the Supreme Court, and works on campaigns that seek further protection for animals, particularly farm animals. We're going to hear a lot more about animal rights in the future. And we're going to hear a lot more about Camille Labchuk. Tell me about Animal Justice. This is an organization that you've been with for quite a long time, and now your role has changed. But tell me about the organization itself. What is it? What does it do? How does it live well, its life? Well, it's exciting. We're Canada's only animal law organization. So there are environmental law organizations in Canada, civil liberties organizations that do legal work. But for a long time, there was no animal law group. Uh, and a group of lawyers saw that in 2008, 2009, and animal justice was actually formed by, by some people who wanted to fill that void and make sure that um, animals, for reasons I'm sure we'll get into, actually have their legal interests represented, that the laws protecting them are actually enforced, and that we start to make progress in the same way that environmentalists and human rights organizations have done with the law. I think a lot of people would be surprised to, to, to realize that there was that much legal work to be done in this field. <laughs> There's an enormous amount. So the field of animal law, it's still very new to Canada. And the idea, of course, is that we go to court uh, to enforce the laws to protect animals, that we bring lawsuits targeting animal abusers, that we uh, help get better laws passed through the legislatures and through Parliament. Uh, but for a long time that was happening in, um, you know, less of a concerted manner. And Canada was actually quite far behind compared to countries like the United States in this field. They've had lawyers down there working on animal cases for over 30 years. So we have a lot of catching up to do and I think we're starting to make progress toward that end. So leave me through a, leave me through a day or, or a week in your, in your work schedule. What, what, uh, what would you be doing hour by hour, day by day? Well, we really focus on a few key things. So, um, you know, one issue is litigating cases. If, if there's a reason to go to court to protect, protect animals, we'll try to do so. Um, another, of course, is passing new laws that protect animals. Right, right now, the state of, of regulations protecting animals and, and laws in general, they're fairly scarce. Uh, and in a lot of situations, there's opportunities to, to get parliaments and legislatures to, to pass new laws or even city councils and municipalities to pass bylaws. And then of course, uh, one big chunk of the puzzle is enforcing the laws that are actually on the books. So sometimes animals actually do have legal protections, but law enforcement agencies aren't aware of uh, situations where they're in violation, or um, in some cases, unfortunately, aren't interested in doing their jobs. So we work on those areas. And you know, my week could be, uh, could be very diverse, so as the executive director I manage most aspects of the organization, whether that be Facebook posting, social media, communicating with members via newsletters, but also, of course, taking on campaigns. Uh, so my week last week, for an example, <laughs> the, uh, on Friday morning, I received an email from a supporter who became aware that there was a lion cub inside a Toronto nightclub the afternoon before. So essentially, a nightclub named Lavelle had opened a new rooftop pool bar. And there were all of these photos geotagged with the name of the Lavelle nightclub posted on Instagram showing people holding this lion cub. Now, it's completely illegal to have a lion cub in Toronto because the city rightfully banned keeping exotic animals. And they do that, of course, because it's uh, you know, incredibly unsafe for people to be exposed to exotic animals like lions that are wild, not tame, not domesticated creatures. And of course, more importantly, it's, it's inappropriate, obviously, to keep animals, exotic animals like that, in captivity. And so uh, Toronto has a ban on keeping those animals. So we contacted law enforcement right away, and Toronto Animal Services started investigating. Um, so 
one thing that we also want to do and ensure happens is expose these cases to the media so that people are aware of the issues. People know that if they see a line in a nightclub, they can speak up. <laughs> so my, the rest of my day was consumed with media interviews and, and getting attention to that issue. And what was the, well, a couple of things about it, because I saw a lot of that stuff too, and I thought, where does that lion come from, and, and where does it go, and how did the matter get resolved? Well, it's, it's unclear. No one's determined officially where the lion came from, but what we did determine, and we did a lot of internet research comparing photos of that lion cub to photos of, of other lion cubs in the area, and the lion cub was wearing a very distinctive collar with a spotted pattern, a red and green and blue type, type pattern. And photos on a nearby zoo Facebook page, the Bowmanville Zoo, showed a lion cub wearing that same collar. So we're very suspicious that the Bowmanville Zoo brought that lion cub into the city of Toronto, improperly, potentially. And uh, of course, we pass that information on to law enforcement. So they're following up, and I fully expect uh, there to be some decision in this case soon. Would the, would the owner of the club have kind of contacted the zoo and said, can we borrow a lion? You know what I mean? It's just, here's the cub out here at the Bowmanville Zoo, and now here it is downtown. How'd that happen? Well, it's hard to say at this point. The information's not all in. But what we do know is it's all too common that people think it's somehow cool or fun to bring exotic animals to events. And we've seen that happen before with, with nightclubs in Toronto. We've seen that happen very recently with uh, a birthday party or an engagement party, an event associated with Justin Bieber's father. There were exotic animals like tigers and, and lions appearing at this event. And it appeared that those animals were also from the Bowmanville Zoo. So they've actually been warned already about bringing prohibited animals into the city of Toronto and elsewhere. But tragically, it's all too common that, that people have this idea that it's somehow fun or interesting to bring animals like this to inappropriate events. And what we're trying to do is, of course, enforce the laws, but also show people that these animals are not toys. They're, they're living creatures. They have feelings and minds of their own. And they shouldn't be treated uh, you know, like stuffed animals for people's entertainment. There's a huge change in consciousness here, isn't there? Like when I was growing up, and I, that was quite a while ago, uh, but. But, you know, circuses were, were all animal acts kind of thing. It was, you know, there were elephants and chimpanzees riding bicycles and all kinds of stuff like that. And it seems as though we've begun to understand that, that, we, that they are not there for our enjoyment, right? That they have rights and lives of their own. I think you're right. Of all of the areas in which we use animals, and there's a lot. There's entertainment, obviously. There's also food. You know, of all of those areas, I think people are starting to realize now that it's just not acceptable anymore to force these animals to perform tricks or to be caged just so we can look at them and get a few cheap thrills. And we're seeing this now, as you mentioned, with, with circuses. Uh, elephants, in particular, are rapidly vanishing from circuses in North America, uh, Canada and the U.S., and around the world. So Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey, those are you know, the biggest circus operators in the United States, they said this year for the first time that they're retiring their elephants. And the reason for that is because there have been decades of public protests where people have showed up at the circus and said, this is not acceptable. Um, you know, it's unfair, it's cruel to these animals to force them to perform silly tricks. And of course, the training methods are incredibly cruel, and that's a factor that plays into it. And, you know, animals are routinely separated from their families so that they can be used in these ways. And so that's what people were saying. And finally, the circus industry was forced to listen, and they had to retire their elephants. Uh, this year, there aren't any elephant acts and circuses in Canada for the first time in um, as, you know, as long as I can remember. Uh, SeaWorld is another issue. They, of course, have used orcas in their shows for decades, and despite people demanding that they stop, didn't listen. Until recently, those cries got loud enough that they had to, and now their, their orcas are no longer performing. So that really tells you about social change, doesn't it? I mean, that the, that the voices are getting louder and more people are speaking up and more and more people are more and more uncomfortable with, with that sort of use of animals. Absolutely. You know, I, I see that the use of animals is rapidly be becoming relegated to the page of history books as far as entertainment goes. And I think we're seeing that as well with zoos. It's not a single week that passes that we don't see a tragic accident or uh, you know, predictable consequence, unfortunately, of captivity. 
um, happen at the zoo. So, you know, in, in August in uh, the Granby Zoo, just outside Montreal, a lion keeper was mauled by a lion. And, you know, that's not surprising to anybody that knows the history of keeping these big cats in, in um, you know, facilities like this. So there have been, you know, at least two dozen deaths in North America since the 1990s and hundreds more people injured by big cats alone. That's just one uh, type of animal that we keep there. And of course, we had Harambe, the, the gorilla at the Cincinnati Zoo, who tragically was shot um, simply because a boy fell into his enclosure. Uh, I think people are starting to look at these incidents and say, enough is enough. Why are we doing this? Let's stop. Yeah, I think uh, I remember somebody in the, in, that I met saying, in that situation, it wasn't the gorilla that should have been shot. There were, <laughs> there were some better candidates for that, for that kind of treatment. But, you know, I was thinking about that, that we've got such a long relationship with animals and, and as, as, uh, as partners, basically as working companions, oxen and horses, and, um, and when, even elephants. I mean, I gather that's the relationship between some elephants and, and their, uh, their owners, for, which is, I guess, the unfortunate term, but in India is, is extremely close and, you know, they rely on each other in a, in a certain kind of way. Yeah, I think there's, we, we're now getting to a point where we have to start distinguishing between some of those kinds of uses. Well, how do you feel about some of those kinds of uses? How do you feel about the use of the oxen, for example, in Wagyon in Nova Scotia? Right, well, I guess I would say that, you know, at one point we relied on horses and buggies to get around and then came in the electric car. And you know, in a lot of ways, what we're seeing now is new technologies, new ways of doing things that don't hinge on using animals. And I think we should move towards those alternatives. Uh, we, there are no reasons that we, at this point in our history, in human history, need to use animals for anything, uh, really. Certainly not in North America, which is where the bulk of my work is focused. So I would say that you know we're rapidly relegating those old uses of animals to the pages of the history books and moving forward w without them. What about food animals? That's that's the other one that obviously is well, obviously that's the towering issue, isn't it? Right. And, uh, where yeah. Are we with that? Well, you know, almost all of the animals that we use and abuse, unfortunately, are used in the food system. In in Canada, we kill 700 million um, chickens alone and millions of other cows and pigs just for food. Uh, you know, that really dwarfs all of the other animals that we use in a sense. So it's always been a major focus of animal justice and of mine personally is, is to try to help those animals. And it's not only the numbers that we use, but what they experience um, is also worse in many respects uh, than anything you can imagine. So animals on factory farms are confined uh, in many cases in dark windowless barns. I think we've now seen enough undercover investigations by organizations in Canada that have really exposed to us what those animals endure, and it, it's not pretty. We see blatant abuse. We see animals being kicked and shoved and punched and hit with objects. Uh, we see them with untreated medical conditions that don't get veterinary attention. And I think a lot of people are starting to ask, you know, why, why do we need to do it this way? Is, is this how we need to treat animals? And one thing that we're working on doing is really exposing that, but also ensuring that the laws that do protect animals on farms, because there are uh, some laws that can be applied, are actually enforced. Because what we see really is a lack of inspection on farms, a lack of enforcement of the basic standards that apply. And of course, government needs to step in and regulate these facilities so that there are enforceable um, standards that are regularly inspected. And the, the whole issue of enforcement, and we see this in, in many of the interviews we've done in many different fields, that the laws are on the books. Um, for example, we did a whole documentary on salmon farming, mm -hmm. and there's lots of regulations about salmon farming, but the, the regulators are the same people who are the encouragers of the industry, and they don't have a budget for that kind of stuff. They don't, like, would you believe the Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, which is supposed to be supervising these farms, doesn't have a boat, right? So, <laughs> That's shocking, you know, an analogous situation, and I'll just pick one I could choose from literally dozens of examples, is Ontario somewhat regulates animals used in laboratory experiments by researchers, and um, the last time I heard they only had one provincial inspector to inspect labs in the entire province. Uh, you know, I think that's a pretty, num a pretty minimal number when you consider that there's at least millions used. And you could say the same thing is about farms, um, 700 million animals used and, and killed 
uh, over 700 million every year on farms, and the inspection there is, is just not adequate. When you say farms in that sentence, you're not really talking about old McDonald, right? You're, you're, you're talking about a very different thing that still has the, the word farm attached to it, but it's not the same. No, no, old McDonald's farm doesn't really exist anymore. That's the tragic reality. Farmers are under contract uh, to large producers who care little for the welfare of animals, but care a lot for making profits. And unfortunately, they treat animals like units of production. They don't treat them like the sentient beings they are. Uh, many of us in Canada have cats and dogs that we know and love. And I think what more and more people are starting to realize is the, the animals raised and, and killed on farms are every bit as um, loving, as friendly. They have personalities just like the cats and dogs that, that we know and love. And I think w you know, when you look at cases um, against cats and dogs, uh, anytime there's a puppy mill exposed, people cry bloody murder. There is outrage about how those animals are treated. Um, puppy mills, of course, are breeding facilities where cats and dogs are, or in this case, dogs are produced for, for sale in pet stores. Uh, we do the same thing to farm animals, and there's much less of an outcry traditionally. I think that's starting to change, but you know, I I if any one of us treated a, a cat or a dog the way many farm animals are treated, there would be cruelty charges laid. There might be. Yeah, there might be. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully, no. there, uh, there certainly be. there would be a better <laughs> chance yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, but uh, um, uh, there's, there, there gets to be an area here too where you say, okay, but, it, but we, we own the cats and dogs that, that we are part of our lives and that we love so much. I wonder if that's even a questionable practice, you know? Ult ultimately, if they have, if they have rights, um, who asked them if they wanted to be kept in houses with collars and bored out of their skulls all their lives, you know? Yeah, and that's actually a really you know, interesting issue. I think by and large of all the animals we use, our, our domesticated pets that, that live in our houses have it likely the best. But they have you know, hidden lives as well and secret lives. And you know, I think that far too many of them are unhappy and suffering from bored, boredom and loneliness um, when we're not around. So you know, it's important not to think of them just as something there to entertain us, but of course as individuals as well that, that have their own likes and wants and needs and personalities and relationships with ourselves and with other animals. I, I, this becomes very personal for me because we have two Shetland sheepdogs and one of the things about Shelties is that they're really smart dogs, <laughs> right? You know? And I don't think these guys, I mean, we, live at, we work at home, both of us, and we, we're, we're with them more or less all the time, but we, don't, we aren't able to do a great deal with them. And I think these are, you know, these are animals that could do with a lot more stimulation than we can give them. And yet we do pretty well, I think, by comparison with a lot of people, you know? You know, it's a big responsibility to care for another being, whether it be a child or whether it, it be a pet. And, and you're right, um, I think a lot of cats and dogs and other animals who live with us have it pretty good, um, especially when you compare them to the rest of the animals that society uses. But I do hope that we're always looking for ways to make their lives better and, and richer and more full. Yeah, I think that's good. Mm. Yeah. So tell me about some more of the cases that you get involved with. You've, you've had, well, you've had a very strong position about the, about the Calgary Stampede, which must make you really popular in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was actually born in Alberta, and mm -hmm. I lived there until I was four years old, and my dad is still there, along with uh, half of my family. So I feel that as a, you know, essentially a native Albertan, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm well qualified to speak about the stampede. Um, but yes, w it goes back to the question of using animals for entertainment. And one of the worst ways that we abuse animals for entertainment, in my opinion, is the Calgary Stampede rodeo events. And, and not just the Stampede, but small rodeos across the country that don't get as much attention and media focus as the Stampede. There are incredibly cruel events that use these animals. Um, unfortunately, calves, steers, horses. Uh, chuck wagon races, for instance, at the Calgary Stampede. This was the first year in recent memory that a horse didn't die, at least one horse didn't die at a chuck wagon race. Um, pretty much every year there's a pile up, there's a crash, and a horse gets injured and then is put down. Uh, it's completely preventable, but it's very tragic. And then you look at something like steer wrestling, where uh, you know men jump on top of steers and wrestle to them to the ground, or calf roping, where baby cows, baby calves are pursued by men on horses and they're roped around the neck and they're you know, tied down on the ground. 
What's important to remember about animals like calves, like steers, like horses, it, is that they're prey animals and they have a very strong flight response and a fear response in um, situations where they could be prey. So it's incredibly terrifying for them and it's very traumatic for them to be chased in this way, to be pursued in this way. And they don't understand what's happening. They don't have a context for this. They, they don't understand in the same way that a human playing a sports game might understand that it's just a game, the way the humans see it. So it's, uh, you know, it's both physically traumatic and there are injuries every year, but also psychologically traumatic for these animals. We would go so far as to say that it's illegal animal abuse under Alberta laws and the laws of other provinces to inflict this kind of deliberate distress onto animals just so some people can get a few cheap thrills. That takes us back to the question of enforcement because it would be a brave enforcement officer who would go to the Calgary Stampede and stop the chuck wagon race, wouldn't it? I think you're right, and that's the biggest, one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle in this situation. We were among the first groups ever to call for charges actually to be laid in these situations where animals are injured or terrified by rodeo events. And in Calgary, the, the, the laws are enforced, these laws anyways are enforced by the Calgary Humane Society, which has the legal authority to do so. And unfortunately, they've, they've chosen not to exercise their authority in this way. Uh, it's puzzling to me because they do have a policy statement on their website that says, we oppose these cruel events, um, yet they're vested with the responsibility and the right to go and lay charges if they think it's appropriate, and they don't go ahead and do that despite opposing these events. So in our view, that's hugely problematic. If nobody's enforcing the laws, they might as well not exist. So what can you do? as animal justice or as a solo practitioner, but what can you do about that situation? Is there any way that you can compel them to discharge their mandate properly? Well, I think one of the best ways to get a legal actor to actually do their job is by public pressure. And uh, luckily, this is something that we can all do. I'm proud of what animal justice does in, is in that we draw attention to these issues. And I think we try to expose an action by law enforcement and really remind people that there are laws and that they should be applied. And that's something that each of us can do. Every time we see a situation that we believe is animal abuse, we can uh, report that to the authorities. I think there's often a temptation um, not to bother because, well, they're not gonna do anything anyway. And it's really unfortunate um, that we've all sort of come to feel that way. And, and, but the reality is that we can make a change by simply reporting animal abuse. Um, the more that authorities hear from us, the more that they hear from citizens that we believe something is abuse and we want the laws applied, uh, the more that they're going to be put into a position where they feel like they have to act and do their jobs. Yes, but you know, I, 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 I come back to the salmon thing, which is a really an interesting sort of subset of a lot of this kind of thing, and it seems as though there's no amount of pressure that will make the the governments actually take action on these things, or even you know even enforce things like the st the stocking densities in cages, the number of cages in the you know in a set area, and so on and so forth. These are very basic things. Mm -hmm. Lots of evidence that these uh, regulations are being breached. <coughs> Lots of pressure on government, and nothing happens. You know? Sometimes pressure on law enforcement and government uh, isn't always enough, and other tactics and strategies have to be employed. Uh, I think getting new laws passed is an important aspect of that as well. Um, getting, you know, attitudinal changes within agencies, and it's a long-term project. It, it takes time, and, and unfortunately sometimes, um, you know, uh, the amount of public pressure we can apply at this particular moment uh, won't change things tomorrow, but it all builds over time with people asking for action, people asking for new laws and just generally people not being quiet about it. Uh, it's easy for government to ignore people who care about the animals, who care about the environment. If we stay silent, it's less difficult for them to ignore us. Uh, it's, it's, sorry, it's more difficult for them to ignore us if we're all speaking up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was just wondering about, for example, in some in countries where there are environmental rights, an individual mm -hmm. citizen could actually weigh in on some of these things and, and bring a suit against, let's say, the Alberta Humane Society and say, look, there's your mandate, that's what you're supposed to do, you've got a budget for it, you know, um, and, you know, you are um, basically offending my environmental rights by failing to take action on this, this subject. Um, 
But I guess that's not an easy thing to do in Canada in this area either, is it? Well, that's an exciting possibility. I'm really thrilled by sort of the foothold that the environmental rights movement ha has made in a lot of jurisdictions, and I hope that we develop more of that field in Canada. What's interesting when it comes to animals, again, it's a rights-based question. Animals technically have no big R legal rights. They probably have small R legal rights. So, you know, right now in, in all provinces, it's an offense to cause distress to an animal. And the wording of those laws differs, but in general, people are not supposed to, to harm animals. There's some exceptions to that, but that's the general rule. They're supposed to provide animals in their care with food and water. So you could say that your cat or dog has the right to be free from distress and has the right to appropriate food or water. What becomes a problem is that these rights aren't enforceable by anybody at this point. So the animal, his or herself, has no right to go to court or has no right for a group like Animal Justice or another lawyer or guardian to go to court on their behalf and actually enforce those rights if they're being violated. Uh, that's, that's a situation um, you know, where certainly no court has declared that they have those rights. We would argue per perhaps that they do have the right to, to enforce their, their legal rights under the law. So I, you know, I think what we're going to see in, in a lot of areas, and the environment is one, and animals are another area, is lawyers, regular people, citizens groups getting engaged and actually pushing the law in the right direction to give uh, you know, greater standing to animals, and ensure that their rights are enforced, uh, in the same way that environmentalists and advocates have done. You know, one of the people who's had a huge influence on my thinking about all of this is a guy named Christopher Stone. I don't know if he's some come across your horizon, but he wrote a, a piece back in the early 70s called Should Trees Have Standing Towards Legal Rights for Natural Objects? And he argued that there's been a constant, I mean, this is the really lovely part of this whole discussion, is he's argued there's been a constant expansion of our recognition of the rights of, of you know, different groups of people and other, other uh, animals over the years. I mean, that, that, you know, there was a time when slaves were people who had no rights. There was a time when women didn't have some of the rights that men had. There was a time when children were property of, the, of their parents and that kind of thing. And that the, he sees kind of the march of civilization as being the extension of rights to more and more entities that, uh, that are alive. You know? Well, one of my favorite quotes uh, is, the moral arc of the universe is long but bends toward justice. And I think you're right. Oh, isn't that <laughs> lovely? <laughs> <laughs> we are expanding rights constantly to groups all the time, marginalized groups all the time. And there's a lot of progress left to be made for women, for uh, you know, racialized communities, for the environment certainly, and especially for animals. Out of all the groups right now that uh, need protection, they are in, I think, the most dire situation. Uh, but you're right, the, the situation is improving and it, it wouldn't improve and it has never improved throughout the course of history without people being extremely vocal, extremely active and trying innovative legal strategies. And that's one thing that excites me about the field of animal law is the ability to, to do the, those types of cases that move rights forward. There's a group I really admire in the United States called the Non-Human Rights Project. And that's headed up by a, a lawyer named Stephen Wise, a brilliant animal rights lawyer. His decades-long mission, and he's written academically, he's written books on this, is to get legal standing and personhood rights for animals. And he's, he's actually started filing cases through the Non-Human Rights Project on behalf of chimpanzees in New York State. He's, uh, he's seeking habeas corpus for these chimpanzees, which is an ancient writ. It essentially evolved to protect people who were imprisoned from being unlawfully imprisoned. So somebody who was imprisoned could have uh, the case brought before a judge to say, this person's imprisoning me unlawfully. I would like them to show cause for why I should be held in detention. And at that point, they would have an opportunity to make their case and, and show that they should not be imprisoned. So what the Non-Human Rights Project is doing is filing habeas corpus suits on behalf of chimpanzees who are kept in various conditions of confinement in zoos, roadside zoos, uh, other entertainment and research in uh, New York State. And they filed a number of these cases now. They've had varying degrees of success and there are appeals going on. And their next set of plaintiffs is going to be elephants who are also unlawfully confined. 
So what we're seeing right now is that, you know, the real start of a revolution in the way we think about legal standing for animals and that really mirrors what we, what we saw happen for, for slaves, for, for women, for, for children. And it's an exciting time. Absolutely. It's, I, think, I'm, I think I'm right in that the habeas corpus was used uh, with an orangutan in, in Argentina. Uh, and the orangutan named Sandy and the, the court, the Supreme Court, too. It wasn't the junior court. The Supreme Court ordered that the orangutan be released to a nature preserve because it was a sentient being whose rights were being infringed by captivity. You know, I remember seeing that story in the news. It was right before Christmas in 2014, and I saw it and I thought, wow, everything just changed. <laughs> 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 you know, the reality is I've actually spoken with some lawyers who, who've done extensive research on this, and of course, Argentina has both a different legal system from us and, of course, is uh, conducted in Spanish, so a different language. And it seems that the reality is not quite as exciting as it seemed initially. So perhaps it, it wasn't habeas corpus, but there was some favorable decision on, on the part of the orangutan. But just getting to the point where we expect and think that that's a possibility now under any legal system in the world is really exciting to me because human expectations about the way we treat animals uh, I think are really shifting rapidly and it creates this idea that they should have personhood rights, that they should be recognized as not mere property but as beings of their own right. You've had two really interesting examples, I think, of that in your own, in your own work. And one of them is that you, I think I recall you saying at one point you had worked for, I'm not sure it was animal justice, but you'd worked on a, on a pro bono basis and found that as the time went by that some of the work you had been originally doing pro bono was now being paid, that, they were, that it was now becoming sufficiently mainstream that people were willing to actually pony up money for it. Tell me about that. Sure. Well, I, I had an animal law practice for about a year before I became the executive director of um, animal justice full time. And uh, that was an exciting time for me. I think a couple decades ago, there would have not been the volume of work to support an animal rights lawyer working full time. Uh, certainly, there have been others who have done it before me, so I, I'm not the first. But we got to this point where I was getting calls and emails all the time from people who had animal issues, and they were willing to, you know, pay for the service of a lawyer because it meant that much to them. Uh, one thing I found really gratifying was defending protesters and people who were uh, engaging in demonstrations or protests outside slaughterhouses and on one of these occasions some people blockaded a slaughter uh, truck from entering the slaughterhouse trying to prevent cows from being sent to their deaths essentially those cows were on the truck and they were trying to stop them from being killed and they were arrested and charged with various offenses um, and that was one situation in which the community and people around the world really rose up to support those individuals, to support what they were trying to do and the symbolic message that they were trying to give, which is that we should stop killing animals and abusing and torturing them just for food. Uh, so in that case, uh, you know, I'm happy that they all had their charges um, dealt with and, and with, withdrawn and nobody went away with a criminal record. But it was inspiring that so many people rose up to support that work. Well, that was actually crowdfunding, wasn't it? Which was which was the second aspect I was thinking about, because you had some people coming to you on their own hook, basically saying, I'm willing to pay, pay you to do, take some action here. But then you've got this crowdfunding thing, and that, that suggests there's a real public out there that's willing to take some real action. Right? And we're very grateful that people do care enough about animals to support the work of groups that are trying to improve their status. Uh, you know, the thing about animals is that they can't own property and they don't earn any money. <laughs> so a lot of people say, how would you get paid as an animal rights lawyer to do that? And it really hinges on other human beings caring enough about the world around us, caring enough about our fellow creatures to devote resources to the fight to help them. Taking our responsibilities as human beings, with, as moral human beings seriously, even when it's not required of us, right? Exactly, and it's, it's so gratifying, it's so inspiring that there are so many people ar across Canada, the United States, around the world, who see this as uh, one of the moral defining issues of our time, our treatment of animals. And, you know, they really know that this fight won't be won without resources. Unfortunately, the industries that use and, and kill animals are billion dollar industries, and so Whatever resources anyone can devote to the fight to help these animals makes a huge difference. Well, we see this in so many areas, too. I mean, we see this with respect to the forests, for example, with the, with the forest products industries, which are massive, massive things. And, you know, and 
and in effect, they're doing very similar treating treating plants in very much the same way that we're talking about with respect to animals. You know? We uh, interviewed a, a man, uh, a lawyer in Holland named Jan van de Venus, who you may have run into, but he ran, he has started up a crowdfunding um, site designed to provide funds to assist environmental defenders and others in this, in this area. It's called the Crowd Versus. And, uh, uh, and, so, and that struck me as being a really interesting development that would, you know, would, uh, would resonate here if we did it, something like that. Oh, fantastic. I, I think it's really important to support the people who are out there putting themselves on the lines, trying to defend nature, trying to defend animals. Yeah, yeah, sounds fantastic. You had a very high profile case lately that involved bestiality. Unfortunately, yes. Tell me about that one. Sure. Well, it's, it's a really tragic case, and I won't get into too many of the details, but uh, this, this was the first time the Supreme Court of Canada considered a case that directly looks at an animal's interest in being free from harm and suffering. And the context of this is that there was a, a man in BC who was convicted of just horrific sexual offenses against his teenage stepdaughters. One of the offenses involved the family dog, and um, he, he brought the dog into the abuse in a way that didn't involve penetration by anybody, um, and not sexual intercourse. So he was convicted of that offense of bestiality, and he appealed it. And the Court of Appeal in British Columbia said, actually, you can't be convicted of this offense because there was no sexual intercourse involved with the animal, and our bestiality laws only cover a very narrow range of actions. Not all sexual abuse of animals is covered. Uh, so we saw that decision and we were absolutely shocked because uh, I think it's pretty obvious to anyone in this country who hears about this issue that animals must be protected from all forms of sexual abuse. That's incredibly important. There's no justification for, for allowing anything like that to happen. So the case was appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada and we knew that we had to get involved as, as soon as we saw that it was being appealed. So Animal Justice put in an application to intervene in the case. And we were uh, just thrilled that the court accepted our application and let us be there. So we were allowed to submit both written arguments and also appear in person at the hearing and argue for 10 minutes about why animals deserve protection from all of this type of abuse. Uh, and the court took six months to come out with their decision. It, it was issued in June. And uh, the ruling was not uh, what we'd hoped for. The court agreed with the defendant who argued that the, the offense should be interpreted quite narrowly and that only certain acts were covered. So the ruling was a disappointment itself. The outcome was, I should say. Uh, but the decision was actually a huge step forward for the field of animal law in Canada. And the reason for that is that the court recognized for the very first time ever that animals are important to people, that we as a society value them, uh, and that protecting them is a fundamental societal value. And the court did not have to go that far. They chose to go to f that far because uh, there was a reason to do so. So although the outcome in the case was not what we'd hoped, the actual decision lays the groundwork for all future cases. And I can't imagine any future animal case coming before any court where that Supreme Court case is not cited. Yeah, and it's a Supreme Court case. There's, there's you know, it's beyond appeal, right? That's it's the uh, highest court in the country. <clears throat> yeah. And wasn't it, uh, am I right in thinking that Rosalie Abella, who has had a, a luminous career, I think, as a judge, was also a, played a key role in that, that outcome? Right? That's right. So uh, Justice Abella was the sole dissenting judge on that case. She disagreed with the decision of the majority, and she said, listen, Parliament, which sets laws in Canada, cannot have turned a blind eye to the issue of all sexual abuse of animals. Surely, when they enacted these laws, they must have intended that the laws cover all forms of abuse against animals, and not just this narrow subset of penetrative types of abuse. And uh, we were thrilled that Justice Abella actually adopted a lot of our arguments in, in her um, decision. So clearly, we res resonated with at least one judge, and uh, you know, we couldn't be more proud of that. And that's on the record, too. And so now, now people can refer back not just to the decision, but to the dissent and to the reasons for the defense and dissent and the, and the arguments that were brought. That's all part of the, the legal record now, right? It's not Absolutely. And dissents are important, too. The, the majority decision, of course, holds the day, but uh, dissents are very influential. And what you often see is dissents maybe at one point 
being dissents, but then working their way into a majority decision down the road in a you know, future Supreme Court decision. So we think that was uh, extremely important for the field of animal law. Yeah, and now the, the, other, the other judges basically argued that if the Parliament thought this was um, appropriate, they should do something, and Parliament should declare itself on this whole thing. Are you going to pursue that? Yeah, we are. So um, the majority decided that uh, the, the provision against bestiality should include only that narrow subset of acts. But they didn't do that because they don't think animals matter. They did that because there's a principle in criminal law that you shouldn't expand it beyond what's obviously the intent of parliament. So, uh, you know, they took that position based on that principle, and, and that's fine. But what they really did was invite parliament to come along and change that law. They said this is a, a matter for Parliament to act on. So we are pursuing that very actively. I can tell you that people across the country were outraged when they saw this decision, outraged that we have such bad laws in this country that are so desperately in need of being updated that this was the result. And right now there's a private member's bill in Parliament, Bill C-246, and I encourage everyone to look it up. It's uh, put forward by a liberal MP and a lawyer named Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, and it really does a few sort of minor things that bring Canada's animal cruelty laws into the 21st century. So it updates the bestiality offense to cover all sexual acts involving animals to protect them. It closes some loopholes in the animal cruelty section so that prosecutors can have an easier time getting convictions for things like neglecting animals, like dog fighting, and it bans shark finning and cat and dog fur as well. Shark finning. That's been a big issue. Right? It has been. I think the film Shark Water really exposed for people the first time, um, that must have been eight, eight years ago or more at this point, just the tragic number of tens of millions of sharks killed every year, uh, sliced, they, they, have, they have their fins sliced off while they're still alive and are often left to float to the bottom of the ocean to suffocate to death, um, all for a, a delicacy which is shark fin soup. Now that's a, a painfully cruel to, to, to contemplate. But there was an interesting action on that, which was that the Toronto City Council took action. Tell me about that, because the municipal field is a really interesting one in these areas too. Well, that was actually one of Animal Justice's very first campaigns, back when we were known as Lawyers for Animal Welfare. And there were a lot of groups really mobilizing to get Toronto to ban shark fin within its, uh, within its boundaries. So, you know, ban restaurants from sh serving shark fin soup, ban people from owning shark fin products. And there was overwhelming support for that measure, both within the city of Toronto, the population, but also on city council. So they passed that ban, I think it was 38 to 4. And from thenceforth, restaurants were not supposed to serve shark fin soup. The ban was challenged by restaurant owners who thought it was their right to continue to serve products of cruelty and uh, serve products that decimate shark populations. And unfortunately, the court struck down the ban, and uh, I don't agree with the decision. I think that there are some issues with how it was decided, but they essentially said that the city of Toronto did not have the right to enact that ban. Animal justice, as uh, at that point actually tried to intervene in that case and we tried to be there to ensure that the the, the, the perspective of the, of the animals and the perspective of the sharks was represented in the litigation. Uh, that was our first attempt ever to intervene in a case and unfortunately another judge in that case said that no we don't have that right to be there and I think the decision really reflected that the perspective of the animals did not get uh, a fair share, did not get adequate airtime during that proceeding and I wish that we had been there because I think that the result would have been different. Now, after the bestiality case, would that outcome be different? If you had a similar case today, having had the Supreme Court activity that you've seen. It's tremendously validating to an organization to have the Supreme Court say, yes, you're worthy of being there. You have a perspective that's worth listening to. And I think had we had a Supreme Court intervention uh, under our belts at the time we applied to intervene in the Toronto shark fin case, that we may have actually given, uh, been given airtime in that case. Well, I was also thinking that the, the Supreme Court um, in the bestiality case is kind of saying, we agree that this is wrong, and we agree maybe even that this should be the law. We just don't think that it is the law at this point. Right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the, 
more or less the gist of what they were saying? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. In the shark fin case, uh, there was just really no consideration of the fact that this was a law about animals and that protecting animals was sort of a core value of people in Toronto, and that was one of the reasons they wanted this law enacted. And I think now you've got the Supreme Court saying that that's a core value uh, of people, of society, that maybe the outcome would have been different if that case had come first. It's fascinating if you, to have that information. And that's not very long from the shark fin case to the bestiality case, right? What, three, four years, uh, maybe? Yeah, that's, so that's less than three years. Yeah, yeah, so that's quite a big step in a very short period of time. I think the law is changing very rapidly in this area. We, we finally got groups like us, and there are others too, going out and fighting these cases in court and agitating and, and making these issues vocal, making them public in a way that politicians and, of course, our courts just can't ignore. Is it becoming easier for animal justice to be to function as an organization? I'm thinking of specifically you're going to need money, and uh, presumably it has to be raised. Maybe you, you can tell us a bit about that. But I'm, I'm curious if that's becoming easier as the time goes by. Well, I'm really excited by the tremendous support that's out there, and it's growing really rapidly for protecting animals. I get calls and emails every single week, and this is one of the things that's most exciting to me, from students who are about to go to law school or who are already in law school, or even established lawyers who are saying, I want to be an animal lawyer. How do I get into this field? Are there jobs? Are there opportunities? What guidance can you give me? And, uh, you know, I think right now we're seeing really an explosion of people who are considering using the law to protect animals, and that's what's so exciting. That's fascinating. And, and you know, like we've done all this work over the last three or four years on environmental rights in a very broad sense of them. Um, but, but there's something, that, there, environmental rights are, are, are an abstraction in a sense, right? This is very concrete. I mean, this is, you know, these are, you've got lots of cases involving specific animals and specific kinds of forms of cruelty and, and, and abuse and so on and so forth. So presumably once those things start to seize the public imagination, uh, that can snowball very fast. I think so. I think it's easy for people to connect with, with animals. They are increasingly realizing that, you know, we already love cats and dogs and that these other animals that we use in various ways are just like the animals we love. So what's the rationale for treating them this way? What's the rationale for ignoring what legal interests they should have? And I would say that the field of animal law is probably more like human rights law than it is environmental law because of that abstraction. The environment's a very abstract concept that's of course important to us or should be, but animals are concrete physical beings that we can see, um, that we know suffer, that we know feel pain, that science tells us are, are just like us in all the ways that matter. And that's also fairly new. I mean, you're, you've got a degree in psychology, as I recall, and, and, but psychologists used to deny that animals had feelings or that animals had consciousness, or, and that wasn't very long ago either. That, you know. Well, no, a few hundred years ago, uh, philosopher Rene Descartes said that animals are just like machines, and if you hear a dog cry, it's uh, similar to if you wind up a clock and you hear a bell ring. It's, it's just a mechanical reaction. And I think that we've gone so far in the other direction right now that, uh, you know, that view is obsolete and is just laughable at this point, frankly. Um, science tells us beyond any shadow of a doubt, both science and our own personal experience with animals tells us that they're living, feeling, thinking beings, that they feel pain just like we do, uh, that they suffer from deprivation, they suffer when they're harmed, but also that they can experience joy, they can experience positive emotions, and that they want to have lives worth living. And that is, uh, uh, in, in a sense, we're dealing with, with, a, with a set of social orders and social arrangements that are based on Descartes, right? And they're, we're just kind of like waking up from that dream, in a sense. I know. Unfortunately, he was very influential, I think, in the early attitudes um, or, you know, attitudes at one point that we had about animals. And it's taken a lot to get past that idea that they're just automatons. And I think that there are powerful industrial interests that are invested in keeping that idea alive, keeping the idea alive that animals don't matter, that they don't feel pain, that they don't suffer. But common sense and scientific evidence tells us otherwise. And that idea is starting to fade away. And in a sense, that's an idea that's held to the advantage of non-human organizations, non-human entities, corporations, corporations whose only interest is profit. Well, exactly. And you can look back at the history of slavery. There were a lot of people who said that slaves, that black people, don't feel pain and aren't like uh, their masters in ways that matter. And 
what I think we're seeing with animals now is something similar. We are just acknowledging that beings are beings, that mammals are mammals, that they all feel pain, they all suffer, they want the same things. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see it with plants too. I do, <laughs> you know, I, but that's another, that's a conversation for another time. One last area that I wanted to talk to you about. We interviewed Jane Goodall, and one of the things that, that Jane said to us, where told us about, was that her whole fantastic career with animals began with one dog. Mm. And, and, one, and it wasn't even her dog. It was a dog that was a friend when she was young, and they, they kind of got together when she was going to school and coming back with it, and, she, and that dog made such an impression upon her with how much of a sentient being it was and, and how much joy it gave her and how much she could or, you know, could give to the dog, that really was the foundation for that fantastic career. Is there a similar story about Camille? It was never one animal for me. I always had cats when we were growing up and I was very well aware from a young age that they're individuals, they have personalities, they've got likes, they've got dislikes, they've got wants and needs. Uh, one of my earliest memories of just being outraged and really concerned about animals and their treatment was watching footage of the seal hunt, the commercial seal kill on the East Coast on television when I was about eight or nine years old. And that really stuck with me. I just thought, why, why are we doing this? Why is this necessary? And when I was 12, my mother and I watched a documentary again on the CBC about animals being treated. And I actually don't remember the details. It may have been animals used for, uh, for fur. It may have been something else. But it prompted us both to go vegetarian right away. And um, at that point, I think once you stop eating animals, you really sensitize yourself to all the ways that we use them and all the ways that they suffer. And it really snowballed from there for me. But I think Dr. Goodall's story is a really common one, that individual experience with one animal who really teaches you that um, animals are, are people too. And what's inspiring to me right now is the number of farm sanctuaries that are popping up across the country. I know there's some in Nova Scotia, there are many in Ontario, uh, but really everywhere. And those offer both animals a place to be rescued from farm conditions and to have a sanctuary, but also the opportunity for people to go there to meet those animals, and especially when we're thinking of animals killed for food, to really realize that they're individuals too, that they've got personalities, they, they like scratches behind the ears, they like belly rubs, uh, that they like, you know, chickens can purr, chickens like being stroked, chickens can have friends too. So I, I, it's really exciting to me that I think people are increasingly viewing farm animals just the way we view dogs or cats. That is fascinating, yeah. yeah. That, uh, well, I, 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 uh, I come back to the oxen because my, my wife did a, uh, an article on oxen, mm -hmm. and the bond between the people and the oxen is more like a bond between uh, people and their pets. I mean, they, they, they got to be so close together, working so closely together in the woods, and, and uh, you know when when men would talk about the oxen in their lives, they would cry. They were they, they were that, uh, and the oxen, you know, they see the oxen were well treated and, and you know very very deeply valued. You know? Well, friendship knows no species boundaries. I think we all have friends who are not all of us, but many of us have friends who are animals. Uh, we know that animals have friends who are of different species. Uh, the most common example is cats or dogs who live in the same house, but. These days, the power of internet videos, the power of YouTube, we, we can all go and check out friendships between cats and ducks or um, gerbils and puppy dogs. It's, it, it's everywhere. Camille Labchuk of Animal Justice, who established Canada's first animal rights law firm. The Green interview has paid a lot of attention to advocates for expanding the human right to clean air and water. That's the subject of our recent film, Green Rights, also posted on this site. The further extension of those rights to the natural world and the animals is the logical next step, both in morals and in law. The experts on this subject include Cormac Cullinan of South Africa, author of Wild Law, and John Boros, an Anishinaabe law professor deeply versed in Canada's common law system and also in the very different legal traditions of our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. Those two green interviews have stimulated a lot of fresh thinking about what the law is and what it could be. Take a look. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron.